talk today and and introduce the panel. So of what we're talking about today and the focus will be aligning private and public sector financing for climate change. We have three panelists here. We have Alan Miller, who is with the Cedar Project. We have James Close, who is with the World Bank, and Zephyr Taylor, who is from USAID. And we're very honored to have these folks speaking. With regard to the Cedar Project, for those who don't know it, it is a USAID project that's funded out of the E3 Bureau, which is the um, Economic Growth Environment, um, Economic Growth Education and Environment and mostly coming from funds from the Global Climate Change Office, which is where Zephyr is from. We have the mandate in which we're to support countries to help them build up low carbon and climate resilient activities. So we're looking at a project that can help fund air, um, activities, be they policies, projects, programs, across the three pillars adaptation, green energy, sustainable landscapes. So that's our mandate. It's a pretty sweeping mandate. And we can therefore really focus on some sub areas below that, which are finance, that's a major area, the integration of your activities across some of these three pillars. And of course, we're looking at vulnerable populations. We're looking at um, gender issues as well and in integrating those. The idea being that we want to mainstream activities and programs into development. A little bit about the series. The series is going to be a monthly uh, program. And you'll see up on the website for the series, there will be a set of speakers each month that are listed. The idea is to bring in experts to have a dialogue among the community and with our webinar community as well and talk about these critical issues that we see are really on the frontier. And as, the, as we come out of COP20 um, and come out of Lima, you know, what are some of the key issues that we want to deal with, and particularly looking at it from an economic analysis perspective, so that we can really make the business and investment case, as well as the socioeconomic case for doing mitigation and adaptation actions. But we also want to look at how do we finance this. And our focus today will be looking at the financing coming from both uh, private and public sector perspectives. So we've gone through the welcome. Alan will introduce first the broad view and make, make some of the general comments with regard to how we finance right now climate change and what are the sources of funds, uh, who where most of the funds are going to, what's the balance between private and public. Then James is going to talk a lot about just climate financing and the experience of the bank and other uh, multilateral development banks over the last few years and where they're heading also. Then Zephyr is going to come in and talk in, in more detail about what we've been doing at USAID with regard to getting more into depth on the private financing and aligning the sort of market transformations that we see are necessary for really implementing actions over time. Because financing uh, climate change is not just going to be the responsibility of the public sector. It is It really needs and will need to leverage with its seed money a lot of private investment, too. So that's the focus for today. Then we're going to go to an open uh, forum, and we have questions. Now, to those who are on the webinar, I'm not sure if we've got um, the sound coming on yet. We're all on. Thanks. I'm glad to hear you guys who have stuck with us on the webinar. Uh, but what we're going to do is do a little bit of polling through this. And the polling questions will be coming to you. You can respond to those. Then we're also going to be asking you who are on the live webinar to put in questions and to do the chat. And we'll be talking about those and answering some of those questions during our open forum at the end. So there's nothing more. I'll just uh, go ahead. Go on to Alan. Thank you, Marcy. Sound good? Um, welcome from uh, myself and to those who are listening, I think, from a number of countries around the world. I know 
at least as far as Vietnam. Um, my own background is having most recently come from the International Finance Corporation, which perhaps is part of the reason for selecting this topic as the first in the series uh, that will, as Marcy said, be monthly. And I'm really pleased that we were able to uh, attract James to come down the street from the bank. Uh, both James and Zephyr have uh, extensive background on exactly the set of issues that we're going to talk about today, which is using such public funds as are going to be available for climate change to meet a much larger need and to uh, attract the kind of sustainable investment that's required to address both climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Uh, I also did, just in terms of the logistics, want to briefly mention that we'll be presenting some of the polling from our webinar participants toward the end of this morning, uh, and also that the bios for the speakers, it would take too long to describe them in any detail, so we're going to let you look them up when you want to say, gee, do I believe what James has just said to me? You can check that out online and look at his bio and you'll find, yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly those years in UK Treasury, James, that must, <laughs> that, that absolutely qualifies you. Uh, and uh, finally, the program will be archived. So if there is anything um, in the slides, um, you don't have to scribble too fast. You'll be able to look them up later. So a few points by way of introduction and background, and again, drawing on my own experience in IFC where as an exclusively private sector finance organization, the whole point was always not to make the biggest investment, to, but to attract sustainable investment. So IFC typically would only make up to 25% uh, of a total investment, some exceptions, but that was the typical rule. So if it was a $100 million project, we would try uh, to do about $25 million. And um, that effective uh, attraction of private investment was really at the core of IFC. And I think, as you'll hear for a number of reasons, it's a lot of what we need to do in thinking about what has to happen in climate change. So first of all, as many of you are familiar with the numbers prepared by CPI, the Climate Policy Initiative, probably the, mo the best, most comprehensive numbers around. They've estimated that the total uh, investment in the climate change arena is on the order of about $350 billion a year. And one of the things about these numbers, um, many of you are very familiar with them, but it's, it's an interesting process. You know, it's like the old joke about a billion here, a billion there. Sooner or later, you have real money. Well, um, in climate change, we throw around a lot of these numbers. And, and um, I would kind of treat them, and I think from looking at James' slides, he treats them also as kind of more indicative than, than precise. Um, but what we already can see, even from such numbers as we have, is that private investment is the bigger part of the pie. So the public funds we hope will grow but they're never going to be at the level of, of, um, of, of private investment. And in fact, um, for many reasons, and I know, again, uh, James and Zeph will go into this further, we're probably underestimating the private money considerably because it's difficult to account and track in areas like energy efficiency, which is embedded in larger investments, and also in climate resilience and adaptation. Very, very few people, governments do adaptation projects. Private companies, at least so far, are not doing, quote, adaptation, unquote, projects. So we're at, this is a, a, a rough picture, and we'll be going into this further. On the other hand, we also know from, again, many other analyses, the World Bank on Economics of Adaptation, um, the New Climate Economy Report last year, we, we have a number of estimates that say we probably need upwards of $100 billion a year more than we're getting uh, to really start shifting the needle toward effective uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And so we're, even if the Green Climate Fund, which many of us hope will attract a lot more investment, the goal this year is to hit $10 billion, which um, 
with help from USAID and the US government, perhaps we might get close. We can hope. Um, but it, we're still going to be very far short ever of achieving that $100 billion. And as one crude metric for that, you can look at total o ODA flows today, which are in the neighborhood of 120 or $130 billion. So $100 billion for climate change alone would mean an equivalent of all the aid for all purposes in the world today. So not very realistic, given where we are. So uh, we're going to need more money. And, and again, we're going to have a more detailed discussion of this. So I'll, uh, I will leave this to, um, to James and Zeph to go into in further detail. But here's another significant qualifier that I think is important contextually. And that is, the issue is not, not the absence of sufficient investment flows globally today. The rough estimate, the best numbers again, probably OECD, of total assets under management are on the order of $75 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Because it's easy to, <laughs> to think, really? Trillion with a T? Yes. And that's, of course, funds that are managed by pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, et cetera. And they are, of course, not going, for the most part, into climate-friendly investments. And they're not, and, and an even smaller part is going into climate-friendly investments in developing countries. So that, a lot of the challenge then is to reallocate, redirect funds away from high carbon, non-resilient investments into lower emission climate resilient projects. And again, I think James and Zeph from their slides, I anticipate are going to both be describing that in some detail. Last point, just as a summary before um, we get into the meat of the discussion. Private funding is going to be the dominant source for low carbon climate resilience development. But there are some key differences going back to the three sectors in the CEDAR program. So if you look at where we are today, there is definitely a dominance of public investment in such funds as are going into climate resilience and adaptation. And certainly, the only projects labeled adaptation are public sector projects. And the donor funds, the adaptation fund, the least developed countries fund, and, and uh, PPCR, for those of you who play acronyms, like Mark here, um, know that that's where the money has been for adaptation. Sustainable landscapes begins to be a somewhat more balanced picture in terms of public and private today. And the dominance really emerges when we talk about clean energy. So that's where we have um, clearly already substantial private investment in commercially sustainable markets. And the question is, how do we move this whole line so that we have a lot more total investment and use public funds more effectively? So with that, I'm delighted to James Close from the Climate Change Group at the World Bank. Um, I, I really want to uh, build on Alan's points around the global context uh, for this. Uh, and as I say, present you with a framework for thinking through uh, some of these challenges so that we as, uh, as financiers and developers and climate uh, interested parties can uh, make sure that we're catalyzing the funds that we've got uh, to deliver the impact that we need. So uh, I don't need to tell you all that uh, climate change is um, fundamental to uh, what uh, we're trying to address here, uh, and also that it's one of the things that uh, really impacts the poorest and the most vulnerable. And uh, you know, as you know, we at the bank have been uh, uh, putting that at the center of our strategy and uh, driving a lot of our development activities uh, through uh, that issue, along with many of our donors and development partners. Um, Paris is really, uh, I think, I was in Lima, it was my first COP, uh, so uh, quite an experience, really. Uh, but uh, I felt that the uh, nature of the dialogue was, uh, was starting to change to a, a real recognition that we need to move to net zero carbon emissions before the end of the century. And uh, that, I think, then starts to frame uh, the pathway that we go through from where we are today uh, to where we need to be uh, to deliver that and uh, what that means in terms of both climate finance and development finance. 
Uh, the other thing I'd say about the, uh, the, the COP in, in Lima was that uh, the mood of the COP, and people tell me that a warm weather COP is a much more sort of amenable thing than a cold weather COP, but, uh, but it was interesting, uh, the, the, the kind of mood in the negotiations was really quite fraught and tense. But outside the negotiations, there was a real sense of uh, opportunity and optimism. And I think that's when you see uh, many of the governments and the private sector coming together uh, to think about the opportunities that moving towards a net zero carbon emissions is going to uh, present to us. And I think that collective ambition is something that uh, we're all going to have to focus on in the course of the next uh, year if we want to get to where we need to get to uh, for Paris. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this is where we have a great opportunity as uh, both uh, climate and development interested uh, people because well-designed climate actions will also give uh, multiple local benefits. And uh, from a financing point of view, uh, we need to be able to factor those in in making the case for that finance. And the things that we need to do in order to do that are get the prices right. So um, you'll see uh, that uh, the bank has got a very significant initiative around putting a price on carbon. Uh, we're also very keen to encourage our client countries uh, to deliver fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, and of course, the low oil prices give us an opportunity uh, to do that. Um, we want to uh, drive efficiency around all of this. I mean, there is uh, a learning curve and a technology curve uh, that we need to go down as quickly as possible. And we're seeing great strides there on the solar front as uh, solar gets to grid parity in many uh, economies. Uh, and we also want to use that to incentivize uh, decarbonization in those economies so that we give them a, a long-term um, confidence that they are on a stable growth platform uh, to where they want to be in the future. And then the third point really here is the importance of addressing resilience. And uh, I think we know uh, now um, uh, as for those of you who struggled into work today, that how challenging it is uh, to deal with a changing climate. And that's in a, in, a, in a very advanced economy. And in many of these uh, developing economies, the challenges are even greater. And that's really important that we bring together uh, climate finance and development finance to address that. Um, and uh, of course, I think part of the optimism in uh, Lima was around uh, the recognition that uh, the allocation of finance is going to drive uh, many of these changes. And I think Alan talked about uh, the amount of finance that there is out there uh, that's uh, tied up in you know, quite often uh, relatively low uh, re returning uh, government bonds. And actually, this can be deployed uh, to be far more uh, productive in many of the economies that we're talking about. Um, and that's where, again, as we start to this opportunity uh, we'll see uh, financiers looking uh, investing in the risk and reward project. And you know, this is where, uh, certainly from, uh, from my private sector experience, there's very conscious of the global competition for capital. And capital, in many ways, is very rational in terms of the way in which it allocates itself uh, in terms of those risks and rewards. Uh, and that means that there are many things that we can do as development professionals to increase uh, credit worthiness and build institutional uh, capacity to uh, present those opportunities uh, to uh, financiers in the most effective way. Um, and uh, I, th I think, you know, again, you can put up any kind of number around all of this, but uh, it's always very large. I think the, uh, the adaptation uh, aspects of this are really particularly interesting. Um, you know, even if we just manage to get through a two-degree world, we're still talking about huge amounts of adaptation uh, finance. And if we head towards anything other than a two-degree world, I think the estimates are that those numbers uh, will double and it probably increase incrementally uh, as temperatures increase. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I think uh, as we present this opportunity uh, to the private finance community, uh, we need to show that um, the, the pace of which the investments required and the scale are two really important things. And I think from our point of view, as the development community and the people involved in effectively designing these markets and uh, systems, uh, we need to be very mindful of the alignment of private incentives uh, with the public goals that we're putting in place so that we can create that policy framework uh, that enables uh, for-profit investment. And this is, I think, 
you know, particularly challenging in, uh, when, as you're making a market because uh, clearly we don't want to create uh, super profits and, uh, uh, and, and rents that are far too high. We want to make sure that this is uh, rewarding cap risk taking capital in the appropriate way but also ensuring that that risk-taking capital uh, can uh, uh, reduce its return expectations as uh, it moves um, down the technology curve and deploys in the most effective way. Um, and of course, we need to think about different uh, investor preferences here as well. And I think that's where you know, we're starting to see uh, pension funds thinking differently about uh, the way in which they're looking to de de decarbonize those portfolios as well as sovereign wealth funds. And this is long-term capital uh, that then will have to uh, reallocate it to some of the long-term uh, investment opportunities that we're faced with in many of these uh, countries. Um, and uh, that public finance can really enable us to shift the risk-reward balance for private investors. Um, and there are many interventions that we can do in order to enable that to happen. Uh, you know, you've seen probably the city credit worthiness activity that uh, the bank has been doing and USAID have also been heavily involved with. This is a really good way of looking at the sub-sovereign level to find uh, investment um, uh, opportunities for investment to flow at the urban level where many of these um, resilience and uh, low carbon mitigation projects will actually take place. So uh, we, we've developed this, uh, this framework um, and, uh, and it really it, it tries to capture the essence of um, uh, local and, uh, uh, and global public goods as well. So if you work from the, uh, from the left uh, backwards as you look at this here, the, the left-hand column is very much around uh, the local uh, private and public benefits in developing countries. And this is where uh, what we would describe um, uh, climate uh, resilient development is good development. And uh, if you think about this as the road uh, that um, uh, can be washed away by uh, increases in sea level and, and what you need to do in order to enable that to uh, respond to that uh, change in, uh, in, in the uh, global um, climate. Uh, you think about that incremental capital adding resilience uh, to the development capital and uh, then also encouraging the private sector capital to flow alongside that. And of course, uh, the opportunity for us is to think about this in the broadest uh, possible context um, and uh, uh, in terms of the system uh, around all of that um, and um, in particular uh, to uh, make sure that climate and disaster uh, considerations are not perceived as just additional to development uh, but they're integral and critical for long-term um, sustainable growth and um, that climate resilient development is, is sound and sustainable development. So in the middle here, uh, we look at both global and uh, local uh, benefits. And uh, these are when uh, climate policy interventions um, can deliver local uh, development co-benefits, effectively a double dividend. So we're talking about, for example, improvement in air quality, uh, as well as uh, mitigation uh, that come as a result of this. Um, and uh, we need to build that persuasive argument for distinguishing between development and climate finance for these cases and getting development and climate finance uh, to work together to improve local health, productivity, and to reduce economic waste. Um, and these uh, you know, co-benefits can happen at the early stages of development, and sometimes they do face constraints which we need to address as well. And then on the, uh, the right-hand side, we've got uh, the issue of a global climate benefit uh, only. So this is where countries face a choice of investing in um, essentially a higher carbon, uh, lower cost uh, power generation solution. But actually, uh, in the longer term, that's going to be detrimental both to their economies, but more importantly to the emissions produced as a result of that as it lo locks itself into a, a higher carbon uh, pathway in the future. And this is where you know we have an opportunity uh, to build in uh, the economics that uh, appreciate uh, the difference between that higher carbon solution and the lower carbon solution, uh, and that effectively we're buying down that global public good, um, which is going to be such an important part of um, making sure that this uh, pathway uh, works effectively. And I think um, in particular, um, 
we, we really uh, need to get the incentives and signals right around all of this so that we can leverage that uh, private finance. And not just, you know, high cost private finance, but also the lower cost uh, uh, debt that actually uh, is going to enable this to be the uh, project to be leveraged. Um, and I think it, you know, integral to all, all of this is, you know, the uh, price on carbon. Um, and uh, as I say, we've been uh, advocating for that for a while. Uh, we've now got you know, a very uh, impressive coalin, uh, for, sorry, uh, um, a coalition uh, carbon pricing that's starting to come together of leaders of you know, over 70 different countries and also uh, cities and subnational jurisdictions, uh, as well as um, uh, over 1,000 uh, companies. And that's where a lot of the momentum is starting to build. And uh, you know, I think uh, we, as well as you, are probably starting to think about the social cost of carbon in our projects. And we've, uh, at the bank, issued some guidance around a, a price for carbon that we're looking uh, to uh, apply to all the projects that we undertake, both in the bank and the IFC. Uh, with a view to that uh, price of carbon uh, increasing over a period of time. Uh, so what does that mean for us uh, collectively? Well, I think, um, you know, we do need to systematically integrate climate and disaster considerations. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing that in the work that we're doing uh, on uh, the fund for the poorest that we have, the IDA fund, where... Uh, donors uh, insisted that we screen all our projects for climate and resilience risk. And I know the uh, President of the United States has also applied that principle uh, to all development finance uh, that the U.S. is involved in. So this is a really important part of uh, being aware of this uh, bringing together of development and climate finance in the most effective way. Um, you know, as a multilateral development bank and along with our uh, colleague, uh, we, we can do a very important role in allocating that finance to maximize the development and climate gains. And again, that needs an appreciation of the uh, specific uh, situations in the country, but also the overall economics and financing. Um, and the financial structures that we think about, uh, as Alan said, we need to leverage huge amounts of private capital uh, to make this transition work effectively. And we need to think about those uh, financial structures both for mitigation and adaptation projects. Um, and this will enable us to um, encourage that creation of new uh, private financial instruments. And we're starting to see some of those uh, develop. And uh, indeed, we're uh, working with the private sector to develop some of those, for example, the pilot auction facility, which we're using for uh, methane uh, projects and, and effectively providing a floor price uh, for carbon. Um, and uh, so this, you know, if we can establish those policy frameworks, that's a really important part of what we uh, need to do here to get the pricing right and uh, to take advantage of uh, shifts in fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, of course, innovation is such an important part of this, and in, uh, development finance has a very uh, long track record of bringing innovation to many of these projects, and we need to continue to do that in the context of local and global public goods. Um, and, uh, of course... Uh, there's a huge opportunity to share and disseminate best practice. I think that's a really important part of uh, uh, what we can do and we can build on the experience of the GEF and the Climate Invest Investment Fund, uh, particularly as we think about uh, the GCF and the Green Climate Fund and the role that that has to play. And many of our uh, board members are asking us how we're going to maximize the learning from the SIFs and the GEF uh, for the GCF. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, you manage what you measure, so... Uh, putting more rigor around uh, the metrics and the analytical tools is uh, very important and a very significant feature of also recognizing uh, how we tell the story of where these opportunities lie and how that links to um, a, a lower carbon future, but also great uh, opportunities both for from the development, the climate, and the private finance perspective in terms of deploying that capital in the most efficient way. So I, I will leave it there, but uh, as we, uh, as we, uh, well, we have... Um, a, a quotation just to inspire you on this rather cold Tuesday morning, uh, but uh, I will uh, I will leave it there and uh, look forward to taking questions uh, later on. So thank you. Thanks, James. I'm also just unsure whether I should be using this mic or this one. Okay, uh, I'm going to now just turn it over to Zephyr Taylor. But I did want to just 
make a very brief uh, transitional comment to simply note that um, having only been out of the bank for a year, <laughs> it's very exciting to hear so many things which are moving toward practical operational products and analytical methods in the bank and IFC. And I hope that we'll have at least um, a few minutes. We started a bit late, but we'll have a few minutes because I, I think probably uh, we have a lot of questions to actually hear more about some of the, the details of things that, that uh, James alluded to. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zaf. Thanks, Alan. Um, thanks a lot, James and Alan, for pretty exhaustive and comprehensive coverage on the issue. So I think I risk sounding incredibly redundant in my presentation, but I'll do my best to diversify some of these concepts. Um, with that, wanted to focus a bit on what USAID is doing in the climate finance mobilization. So I'm going to start with some of these high-level concepts, and obviously this goes without saying, but profitability is key, right? I mean. The true alignment of private and public markets, at least when it comes to bringing the private sector to the table, has to be about profitability. And if they're there for some other reason, it begs the question, how are you running your business, right? And so it is our role in the public sector, in the multilateral sector, to figure out ways, and James touched on this quite extensively, to figure out ways to get those price incentives right, to bring the private sector to the table, to make these markets profitable for them. And I note that you know, that's not in any way to downplay the, the value and the role that impact investors uh, and SRIs can play in this space. But when you look at the scale of the climate financing challenge, as Alan laid out in the beginning of the presentation, the private sector is going to need to represent the lion's share of the finance that is put in to the mitigation and the adaptation space if we're really going to achieve the targets that we have set out to keep it in the two degrees scenario. So with that, it's just uh, kind of leads naturally into the idea that public monies, because of their inherent risk threshold uh, nature, they're higher than the private sector. We tend to be a little bit more flexible with the way we can spend our money, and we have a mission focus, right? So we can go in and say, if we lose this money, that's not optimal, but we can, we can tolerate that. And in the private sector, that's just you know, all else equal. That's not going to be the case. And so that's where the public monies can really play a transformational and catalytic role is to being able to buy down some of this upfront risk, particularly in immature markets, which is where a lot of the climate space tends to lie, at least from a perception standpoint at this point. Um, so looking at how public monies can transform markets, um, USA generally supports capacity building, technical assistance, and advisory types of activities. Uh, we do not tend to write checks for hardware. So what we're trying to do is build capacity to get it broader market transformation and reform. Um, I laid out three of the key stakeholders here that we would typically engage with. And this covers you know, the kind of lion's share of the stakeholder categories. You have project developers. You have the investors and financiers on the other side of the table. And then you have the government actors, energy sector regulators, policymakers, et cetera. And these kind of three critical stakeholder areas lead into what we would kind of broadly define as low carbon, climate resilient development. Um, I tried to break it up, our, uh, our kind of technical assistance focus, just for purposes of this discussion, into kind of macro or top down and micro bottom up uh, segmentation. And part of that, I think, is because when you talk about finance or climate finance, the mind naturally gravitates to this idea of transactions. And you know, James elaborated on this extensively, but I mean, our, from the, the public sector, the development organization standpoint, public money doesn't just mean are we co-financing projects, are we, are we directly injecting funds into transactions. It also means taking monies to hire consultants to advise on development of policy and regulatory regimes that make markets broadly more attractive for the private sector to invest in. And so I'll start with that kind of latter point in the macro top-down uh, perspective, and, and that we tend to, we tend to support sector-specific or whole-of-economy planning approaches for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, and this is based on kind of connecting this, sort, this support to broader market reform and development strategies. So this vision of, can we provide early-stage or catalytic capacity-building support that 
in turn will eventually lead to broader market reforming, and in this case, commercialization, privatization of markets so that the private sector has a role to play and they can be sustainable, which is a equivalent of, to, to being profitable as far as their perspective. Um, the micro or bottom up uh, angle is, is a little different, right? That's, for example, sp supporting specific transactions. And I think that there's a, a very valuable role to play from a pilot and demonstration standpoint in that space as well. And so we operate in both places. But ultimately, we always come down to asking ourselves the same question. How will this support accelerate a broader vision for market reform that's going to bring or create opportunities for private investment and bring the private sector players to the table? And that's really where the crux of the alignment of public and private financial markets happens. Um, <clears throat> A couple quick kind of generic examples of what our like macro or top-down USAID support looks like. Market functionality. So supporting a reverse auction for clean energy generation projects. The tendering process. That is an incredibly complex uh, market support mechanism, if you will. And it's relatively new. Obviously, feed-in tariffs kind of ruled the day for the past decade or so. And now reverse auctions are kind of having their, their time in the limelight. Um, support for policy and regulatory regime development. Think specialized tariffs for energy generation. Think streamlined permitting and approval. Market commercialization laws. You know, does an independent power producer, for example, have legal access to plug his wind farm into the grid? And things like setting targets. So what are your targets for renewable energy penetration? What are your targets for the number of villages, households, or businesses that have uh, climate adaptation capacity. Energy sector planning. So looking at it from a long run uh, integrated standpoint, you're working with the electric utilities, you're saying don't just think in an opportunistic demand driven way where you have to just incrementally build out your generation assets in response to the ever increasing demand. Look 30 years down the road, project out what that load increase is going to look like and say to yourself, how can I most effectively from a cost and an operational standpoint, get more clean tech online. And I apologize, I probably disproportionately focus on energy because that's, that's my specialization, but I don't mean to exclude uh, sustainable landscapes and adaptation in this sense. Um, looking at things like resource assessments are also really crucial, I think both for the private sector and helping them identify where the opportunities are at for investment, as well as the public sector to think about things like planning grid expansion, et cetera. Um, micro support, I laid out those three kind of key stakeholder categories here with, a, with some specific examples. Again, so looking at project developers, uh, supporting feasibility and investment studies, doing project incubation and preparation, so helping them with those early stage development uh, processes. Looking at showcasing and presentations, so actually making introductions to prospective financiers and investors. Working directly with the kind of commercial money side of the equation, if you will, credit guarantees, so risk buy-down instruments that actually have value on their balance sheets. How is this going to hedge the risk that I'm taking, whether it's actual or perceived? And I think we probably all agree that in a lot of cases it's, it's more perceived than it is actual. But how can we help support the balance sheet for a commercial lender? Uh, looking at project evaluation support, helping them understand how to evaluate a project proposal that comes to their doorstep and says, I would like a loan for $100 million. Here is my project idea. In a lot of cases, particularly in the emerging markets where we operate, the commercial lenders just don't have the experience and thus the capacity to effectively evaluate these projects. So they're subsequently uncomfortable in writing checks to lend to them. Oh, and then introducing them to pipelines of projects, which I think connects back to the showcasing and presentation. And then lastly, the government entities, electric utilities, municipal water authorities, et cetera. Um, negotiating power purchase agreements, evaluating and tendering projects, and designing, for example, a climate finance facility. These are all kind of broadly examples of the technical assistance and advisory services that both USAID plays, but all of the donor and MDB, broadly the development community plays in helping drive catalytic reform. And I guess this is important to distinguish from, again, just going in and saying, here is some hardware, plug it in, and then we'll leave and, and hope for the best. And it's not to uh, say that there is no role for that, but I think 
at the, at the global scale, at the macro scale, we really need to think about combining both bottom-up with top-down development initiatives to address the climate finance issue. Um, so I'm just going to touch on uh, a few of our highlight projects that are focused more directly on finance. Uh, the Development Credit Authority is an office housed at USAID that does credit guarantees, as I noted earlier. So that's kind of their, their, that's their, uh, their ace in the hole, if you will. They go to commercial lenders and they set up credit guarantees to help buy down the risk of lending to the sector with the hope that those credit guarantees are going to incentivize these private lenders to enter into new markets, and eventually they won't need a credit guarantee anymore to disperse new loans. Uh, the Private Financing and Advisory Network is kind of working on the other side of the equation. That's a program that mentors typically small and medium-sized clean energy project developers on enhancing the commercial viability of their business models as well as the bankability of their investment pits. So think you need to address A, B, and C competitive marketplace issues, and also when you go and give a presentation, wear a tie. Well, not specifically that, but, but that's the kind of thing. Um, Power Africa, which I'm sure most people in this room have heard of, uh, I would say that this is almost an ascending order, if you will, from kind of that micro bottom-up perspective to more macro. And Power Africa, I would say, is, is very much in the middle. It has a lot of uh, transaction advisory and mentoring services associated with its activities, but it also is working on development and establishment of regional power pools. Uh, it's also working on policy and regulatory enhancement or reform. And so that's an example of a program that kind of tries to touch on both of those key levers, if you will, to bring the private sector to the table. They're looking at the demonstration aspect. Okay, how can we help engage both private sector participants as well as the government side of the equation to feel comfortable in tendering, building, and operating these projects. And there's, there's no substitute for learning by doing, as we all know. CEDAR, which is this program that's hosting this, uh, this webinar series, is doing a lot of the high level, low emissions development strategies, planning and analysis work, as well as some of that more micro level finance mobilization, including providing technical assistance and capacity building services directly to private financial lenders, uh, working on establishing partnerships between parastatals, if you will, national regional development banks and private lenders, and then thinking about other innovative climate finance instruments, uh, think climate bond, for example. And as we all know, green bonds in general have been heavily oversubscribed in the past few years, and it's really uh, proven, I think, to be a tremendous um, trend in, in the climate financing world. So. And then lastly, another program that USAID is engaged in as a partner is with the GIZ, the German Development Organization, uh, their program called the Climate Finance Ready, or CF Ready as it's, as it's known. And that's a program that USAID is effectively bought into to partner with GIZ that works with governments on using strategically small amounts, relatively speaking, of public monies to unlock broader sector reform in, in the climate space. And so that says, okay, we will, we will ask for X number of dollars from the Green Climate Fund, if you will, and we will put that, those monies into a broader strategy that specifically says how will they be catalytic to broadly reform our market bring the private sector to the table, bring those fi financial markets into the fold, and do it in a way that's not just asking for the GCF's uh, monies and then saying, thank you very much. We're going to go build a wind farm and plug that in, if you will. Um, and we're happy to an answer questions about any of these uh, other programs offline or in the Q&A session. Um, just a, a real quick recap of what CEDAR is doing principally in this space right now. We're working on developing a climate finance toolkit, which is going to principally be aimed at an audience of policymakers and government stakeholders, but will also have dimensions that are valuable for the private sector as well to think about how to mobilize finance in this space and how to look at these markets from a more private sector profitability standpoint. Uh, the Clean Energy Lending Toolkit is a toolkit specifically aimed at private commercial lenders, which is helping them understand how to develop credit products for clean energy products, how to institutionalize credit lines, how to assess 
their own internal market readiness to enter into these spaces. Climate finance readiness is another kind of dimension of what CEDAR is, is looking at, which is to, to support government policymakers and say, how prepared are you to mobilize climate finance and what are the key levers that you need to flip, if you will, to bring these private financial markets to the table. And then financial occlusion, uh, thinking about gender equality in this space, thinking about how as these economies, as these sectors and markets mature over time, how can we do that in not just a climate friendly way, but how can we do it in a socially responsible way that enhances gender equality and is inclusive in the sense that it brings everyone to the table, not just the traditional stakeholders, if you will. Um, and I just want to note for the folks on the webinar in the previous slide, the GIZ program reference is not on the deck that you are seeing right now, but we will uh, upload this revised version uh, so you can look at it online later. Um, with that, I'll just go to our pictures and we can just stare at those for another 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions and discussion in just a minute. I just did want to note that uh, I think um, Zeph's remarks were really a terrific compliment in adding some perspective both on what USAID is doing, but also on some of the underlying nitty gritty and understanding what are the challenges in moving from the basic idea that, yeah, we need to get a lot more private finance to, OK, how do we do that? What are the products and models? And given the very different challenges between adaptation, sustainable landscapes, and clean energy, the products will need to be correspondingly quite different, and also reflecting the very different needs and circumstances of developing countries. So obviously, the opportunities in China are very and challenges are very different from Cambodia or Sub-Saharan Africa. So I did also want to just very briefly note that um, since this is the first webinar, we were curious who would be logging in. So um, we have uh, at least an earlier on, unless Joan corrects me, we had about 40 logged in at the outset. And we asked them what their backgrounds were of relevance to this discussion. About a third have some involvement with private finance, which I thought was extremely interesting. Uh, uh, another 12% uh, both public and private finance. So if anything, there's a somewhat greater reflection of private finance interest. And also a separate question went to the number directly engaged or in planning or applying for climate finance, which was about half. So I think we have a very interested audience <laughs> and um, hopefully to build on in some of the future webinars. So with that, um, I had many questions, but I want to give the audience, maybe we can just alternate. Uh, first, if you ask a question, could you also just please help both us and people listening by identifying who you are? So initially, some questions from it's a very informed audience, so from the, uh, okay, we'll start in the, in the back. Hi, I'm Aline McMahon, president here at Crown Agents USA. I am not an informed audience <laughs> member, but I was very interested. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, do, I do feel personally that climate change is the most compelling challenge we as a world face. Um, <laughs> to, I don't think I'm overstating it. Um, but my question for um, Zephyr at USAID, do you feel that USAID in the same way and that uh, do you think that the funding for climate change mitigation will be expanding? Answer honestly. <laughs> is, my, is my mic on, John? OK. Um, thanks for giving me the most. Uh, <laughs> Difficult question you could possibly. I thought we agreed this would be a softball situation. But, um, so I'll answer the first, the, the, the latter part of your question first, because that's easy in that uh, I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows whether we'll be expanding, um, particularly given uh, current um, political scenarios. 
Um, it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, that said, I think that if you look over the past uh, five years or so, there has been a, a pretty consistent level of funding, and it has ticked up a bit each year, and that's been uh, that's been promising, I think, from the standpoint of reflecting the interest um, of the institution. So to get at the, the, the first part of your question, um, I think that there's been a lot of support, generally speaking, for the climate issue. Um, and I, I, I won't go as far to say that it is in the short period that the climate initiative has existed that it has become the kind of paramount um, theme of, of the institution. But I would say in general, <clears throat> there is a, quite a bit of support around the agency. Uh, we have a lot of support um, from the top, and that's, that's been really helpful. And we can only kind of continue uh, to improve our ability to kind of integrate it with other sectors. I mean, when we talk about you know, thinking about how we can restructure markets to make them more attractive and, and commercially viable for the private sector. I could even look within uh, USAID, as we all likewise could in our institutions, and say, well, how can we make this more attractive to other uh, counterparts, other members of our institutions, to make them take it more seriously or more interested? And it's probably no more um, germane than in a, in a development organization where you have, uh, you know, the education departments and what they're thinking about is how can we expand education in these uh, struggling economies or you have the health uh, space and we have to think about well how can we make climate germane to the to the activities that that they're pursuing and in that sense uh, help scale up the level of kind of climate focused or oriented um, development work that we're undertaking so I think it's only fair to ask James if he's willing to comment from the World Bank perspective because the same as you said, Zeph, the same question applies. They have the same division of very different sectoral responsibilities. So um, you haven't been in the bank all that long, but what's your perception of how well the bank is coping with, with uh, this perception that climate change is getting worse, but the World Bank continues to have health and education and agriculture and everything else as, as priorities. Well, I, so the point I was making was that climate finance and development finance need to work together, and I think that's very much where our donors are coming from. And uh, you know, Ida Seventeen is a great example of that, where uh, this kind of screening. You should just say what Ida is. Uh, for the that. International <laughs> Development uh, Association, which is the basically the fund for the poorest, um, and uh, you know that. So um, that's where it, it has to come together, and you know. Climate resilient development is good development, and uh, it's it takes a while to kind of um, embed that in the whole organisation. There's a lot of competing priorities around all of this, but I think um, you know we just have to keep uh, responding to the needs of our clients, who um, you know desperately require uh, really good development and climate solutions to enable uh, these activities to happen. Does that mean that it applies absolutely everywhere? Well, you know, clearly not, but. Uh, Certainly, in the, the large infrastructure side of things, it's very important. Thanks. And, and you know, forestry and agriculture another great example yes. where everything's really driven by you know, climate smart agriculture is at the forefront of what we're doing at the bank. I did want to ask uh, Joan, can we read a question from the field, or how do we want to do that? We're doing all of these things for the first time, so bear with us just a little bit here. All right, we have a question from the audience. Santiago Enriquez. He is directing this question to James. He says, how is the World Bank supporting countries to be ready to receive and mobilize climate finance, particularly in least developed countries? Uh, well, again, so part of the IDA requirement was to uh, involve um, climate change as part of uh, the systemic country diagnostic work, I mean, it's a terrible phrase, but the, the systemic country diagnostic work is the underlying analysis to understand what the development challenges are in each individual country. And, uh, and so climate change is a, is, is a very important part of all of that. And framing it in the, uh, you know, the overall analysis of the country then drives it into the country partnership framework and how we're working together with individual countries uh, to uh, to help them uh, create you know a climate smart economy and a you know platform for uh, low carbon growth. 
Okay, we can then come back to the room if somebody, you sure. had a hand up right away okay. in the front row. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who my has the microphone Chief. speaks? My name is okay. J.P. Gibbons. I work with USAID, um, primarily in climate conservation uh, finance work um, through the guarantee program that Zeph mentioned, but also with the Global Climate Change Office. And I'm just asking because Zeph asked me to throw a softball. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so my question is kind of uh, representing some of the private sector people that you mentioned, Ellen, were uh, on the on the webcast. Um, because that's primarily who I work with. And uh, a lot of my work is done in mitigation. And what they want to know, I, I know uh, the majority of those private, private conservation financiers that are in the mitigation space, and they all want to know, well, how can I engage with USAID? How can I engage with these public sector funds? It's a myriad. If, if you go to USAID, it's like I'm talking to this person today, I'm talking to that person tomorrow. How can I benefit from this? And so my question is, how the CEDAR program, how could the private finance uh, funds, the private finance uh, companies uh, benefit from, from this project? And also uh, World Bank, if you have some uh, insight in how um, a small fund that is looking to invest in these types of projects, whether it be mitigation, adaptation, whatever, uh, can utilize these to uh, better benefit their business. I'll start with just a quick response and turn it over to James. Um, Thanks, JP. I think in the case of CEDAR, I mean, because it's principally a program that's providing technical assistance um, in, in the countries or in the particular cases where uh, private sector could play a vital role or we're kind of specifically targeting the private sector. And as you know, part of this plays into just the way our programming decisions are made at the agency, depending on what one of our mission offices is doing in a certain country, et cetera. But I think, um, there's always an opportunity, particularly on the commercial lending side, to engage with the program, to seek that TA, to help them understand how to evaluate these projects, and to help them understand how to set up partnerships with some of the development organizations, like the MDBs, like the, the national or regional development banks, um, to kind of further enhance their efficacy. And part of that enhancement comes from those partnerships helping buy down the risk, uh, maybe it's they're getting early stage grant finance, uh, grant funding to to projects that they're interested in providing mezzanine finance uh, to later or something of that nature, as well as direct technical assistance to helping them understand um, how to lend to the space. And you know, one of the toolkits I mentioned earlier, the Clean Energy Lending Toolkit, in its ability to help uh, commercial um, lenders understand how to develop these credit products and then subsequently institutionalize those credit lines within their agencies is a great example. Oops, Mike. <laughs> this is Marcy Trump. I'm with the CETA Project and Chief of Party. The uh, Clean Energy Lending Toolkit was developed under an earlier program called ALEG and that project um, toolkit, we now we took out in a pilot testing to Liberia, and we're working with DCA approved banks. We're going to be doing the same thing with other uh, countries too. And what it really allows you to do is go in to work with those banks that they don't necessarily have to be DCA approved, but they can be just some of the larger banks in the country or other ones that have expressed an interest in getting into climate. Um, in this case, we were working mostly with clean energy markets. But what we did was we came in and we did a clean energy market diagnostic first to really tell the banks, is there even an opportunity here? Can you make profits in lending to this sector? And if so, who are they? Who are the best um, folks? And what types of projects should you be lending to? Some countries will have a lot of solar. Some countries will have a wind. Some countries may have more micro hydro, um, geothermal. So you need to have that assessment up front, and you need to be able to say to the bank, look, here are where the opportunities are. The second is for the toolkit is to come in and then work with the bank and say, how ready are you to actually take on the market? And do you have uh, product lines developed, or do you, can you modify some of your product lines? So there's a sort of market readiness. And then finally, I would say the third stage is to come in and work with them with technical assistance directly with the bank and start to help them develop those credit 
uh, uh, credit products slash financial instruments so that they're comfortable setting up the credit windows eventually for clean energy. In saying that, you also need to be looking at the pipeline that's going to be coming in so that you're working on both sides. You're helping, in the case of Liberia, there was a very active USAID project that's still going on there right now called IBEX, which is working uh, like PFAN with a lot of the business plans for the project developers. So they help to strengthen them, but in that sense they're saying, if you're going to approach a bank, this is what you need to have ready. And this is, these are the questions they will be asking you. So I think there is this outreach capability that is uh, not only going on a mission by mission, but in, in essence, if there are folks interested in this, they need to, and there are some contact names at the end, contact certainly Zeph, certainly you know Alan and those of us in the CEDAR project, and we can start talking with some of you guys too. Great, did uh, James, you wanted to add something <coughs> to that? No, excuse me. Uh, I mean, I, you know, three things really. Uh, you know, as Alan said, IFC look to invest, and this is for the private sector arm of the World Bank uh, Group. Um, uh, Twenty-five percent in projects, so you know that leaves seventy-five percent for other funds and other investors. Uh, I think the other point is to look where uh, credit worthiness is increasing. So I made the point around city credit worthiness, but also at a country level, uh, that enables uh, a, a put a, put a price on some of the. Uh, risks within a particular country or city or subnational jurisdiction. And then the other thing I think is uh, look for opportunities for blending finance. And I think that's where um, we're going to see some quite interesting uh, developments around the potential of the GCF. We've already seen it to some extent with the SIF and the GEF, although probably not uh, at the level that everybody would really like to see that. Okay. Do we have a question, uh, another question, Joan, from the, from, uh, the field? Andre Mershon from USAID asked if there are any specific private sector finance opportunities in adaptation. Um, he says insurance comes to mind, but are there others we should be looking at? Zeph or James, uh, did you hear the you question? Yes. Yeah. Is there private sector investment in adaptation? Well, I mean, uh, private sector investment in adaptation, I think, is uh, inevitably more difficult than in the mitigation uh, um, sector. Um, I think, but it's also, you know, if you look at these uh, projects and problems in a systemic perspective, you can see adaptation uh, coming together with mitigation as well. And I think that's where, again, um, you need to look at the project in the round. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's adaptation or mitigation. It just needs to be a good project and an investable project. Um, and you can see the benefits uh, coming uh, from all of that. So, you know, obviously, you know, part of what we do around adaptation is... Uh, it is the fact that it's you know, sometimes higher cost as a result of the uh, changing climate, but there's also, I think, opportunities to uh, think of that in a you know, long-term resiliency uh, way and therefore uh, the benefits that come from that. And I think you know, the other thing I'd say is it's quite useful to follow some of the emerging insurance markets here, which is starting to put a price on um, some of those risks, and uh, that's when the private sector can evaluate what's a good investment. Uh, alongside those uh, opportunities. Yeah, very brief comment from the IFC experience is that we actually, for the last four or five years that I was there, had started doing case studies of um, some of our clients and their exposure to financial risks from climate change. And a couple of years ago, IFC and now most of the MDBs have included climate risk screening requirements, which are applicable to their private finance as well as their public finance. So IFC is the only exclusively private financing IFI, but uh, EBRD, ADB, etc., IADB do have private sector lending and they are beginning to incorporate at least uh, risk screening requirements. So there's definitely an awareness building process that um, banks and insurers are also central to uh, beginning to communicate because at the end of the day somebody pays when these disasters hit and business interruption is a very very big economic risk for the private sector so um, I think now we can take another we have a few minutes left another question up here 
Thank you. Hi, my name is Anita Campion. I'm from Connectus Corporation. Uh, we organized the, the Cracking the Nut Conference, and this year the big focus is on developing rural and agricultural markets amid climate change, uh, for which USAID is, is a significant sponsor. My question to all three of you is actually, the, the, the audience we're going to have is primarily development practitioners who are interested in the topic, a lot of them coming from a finance background. What message might be really important to convey to them um, at this upcoming uh, conference in March? Okay. I'm happy to. So the thing that's, uh, you know, I think it probably merits a little bit more thought, but the thing that's on the top of my mind at the moment is forests and um, uh, you know, partly because uh, we're seeing a huge amount of donor activity in forests. Uh, I think we're now developing uh, funding platforms uh, from the FCPF, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, plus the Forest Investment uh, Partnership, which is uh, one of the SIF funds, and the Biocarbon Funds. You know, these funds are starting to come together uh, to deliver, um, uh, you know, to move towards payment for results at scale. And uh, I think we need you know, all the help we can get from uh, our development partners and indeed you know, private sector investors uh, to enable that to happen. And, I, and I'm not just thinking about forests in terms of trees. I'm thinking about the whole ecosystem that sits around uh, forests as well. And, and that forests are really not just good for uh, the planet as a carbon sink, but also as an economy for uh, helping uh, poor people out of poverty. Seth, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I, I won't profess to uh, be an expert in the space because energy markets and finance is where my expertise lie. But <clears throat> um, USAID has supported a number of, of private finance initiatives. Uh, and one that comes to mind is the Athelia Fund, which I am not well versed in. But this is something that the Climate Change Office at USAID has stood up uh, in the past two years. And JP, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, one of my colleagues here yeah, he, he actually was um, heavily engaged in the development of, of that, so I'm not sure if you want to say a word or not, but yeah. Just briefly, and this might be for the private sector people on the line, but uh, through the credit guarantee program uh, that we have, we have worked to uh, support the Ophelia Climate Fund, and in doing so have helped not only mitigate their risk in investments in forest conservation downstream, but also uh, they have told us since our guarantee have substantially increased the amount of private investment into the fund upstream. So uh, just one way you can see how risk mitigant um, and utilizing public sector funds can attract more private sector funds to the space. And uh, just as Anita mentioned, uh, uh, I will be on a panel with Althelia at the Cracking the Nut conference uh, at the beginning of next month. Great. I think we can, um, if we have another question from the field, Joan, we could fit in one more. Elise Che from the Army Corps of Engineers asks, how you would attract private investment and resilient activities that are desirable for private investment but do not have an easily identif identifiable rate of return? James, how would you? <laughs> <laughs> um, with a lot of hard work, I think, is the answer to that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is a kind of uh, journey, isn't it? I mean, um, the whole sort of purpose of this is looking for patient types of capital from the private sector that are prepared to um, work their way through the economics of this and come to a point of view where there's uh, an investable project, but uh, you know you've got to you've got to identify those opportunities that have the potential to uh, be investable, and you've got to put the work in to figure out what the internal rate of return is. And I think you know everything has the cost of capital associated with it. It's just how hard you're prepared to do the analysis to come up, and how confident you are in uh, in in coming up with that number at the end of the day. So. Uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great challenge. But if you can pull it off, uh, you know, it's a huge competitive advantage as a result of that. Maybe just a quick example that actually says it can be, as James is saying, it it's hard, but it can be done. And in IFC, we had a port, private port facility client in Colombia, Port Muebles, and the uh, we had donor funds to do the initial assessment of climate risk. So that that made the hard part a lot less hard. Mm. 
to convince them because we essentially said, well, okay, we'll pay for the consultant to look in detail at how your infrastructure may be adversely affected. And then they were able to take that information, do a financial analysis based on the physical assessment, and then they said, you know what? We have a capital improvement budget. We will roll in that to, you know, there, there was a pretty straightforward risk assessment and financial calculus once they had that climate information. But that's still where the hard part is because that detailed localized climate information, um, despite some of the products the World Bank has been working on, is still not that readily available. Do we, can we take, uh, squeeze in one more or do we need to? Okay, one Hi, last thank comment. Thank you. Well, thanks for both your presentations. They were great. I'm Michelle Jennings from USAID. And it's kind of springboarding from that discussion, like an example that comes to mind from that question is, you know, ag value chains and cash crops, cacao, coffee would be, you know, easy rate of return. But what about in the ag sector where there isn't such an obvious, um, you know, rate, um, you know, benefit and rate of re return? And you had mentioned climate smart ag, and I know World Bank is also doing like the nat natural capital evaluation. And so how is that factored into the way you're looking at climate finance, these different opportunities? Well, um, yeah. again, I'm not sure it's a question that I can answer very uh, precisely, very quickly. But uh, you know, I think this what, what you see in terms of where we're trying to migrate to is uh, a more kind of um, a rounded view of the underlying economics and financial positioning around all of this, and bringing and Waves is a good example uh, of uh, incorporating natural capital accounting and how that works. So these things have to kind of come together and then start to um, frame those opportunities in with as much kind of analytical rigor as is possible. I mean, it's still very difficult. I mean, we were uh, at a session yesterday on climate change and poverty and looking at um, uh, uh, low-lying coastal zones and uh, uh, subtropical forests and uh, uh, and drylands, and they all have their own different challenges. But you know, putting getting the data out there is just a helpful way of uh, presenting some of those opportunities and enabling people to do the analysis based on the data that's available. It's never going to be perfect, but you've got to make some judgments around some of these things. You want to add, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I without going in detail, I would just say that. You know, in addition to just having better data um, management, better analyses for these sorts of things, I think this is where, at least conceptually, the idea of innovative financial products can really come into play. And it's it's kind of speaks to this evolution in thinking about how can you package risks and revenue streams that uh, are, are unconventional, that might, you know, in the current time or 20 years ago would have never came to mind is the way that you could create a financial product that is investable. And I think um, putting a lot more of our energy in to trying to identify what those packages could look like that are going to be attractive to the private uh, capital markets, I think, is, is really key. And so, you know, looking at the ag sector is a great way to think about that. And I think if you, if you look back historically, you'll see this in a lot of spaces. I mean, the, the evolution of financial technology has changed the way we invest and look at, at, at various uh, products or spaces in ways that previously we would have never even thought of. And so I think this is just a new frontier um, of bringing that kind of private sector market you know, energy and that efficiency to the table is thinking about you know, how can we kind of rejigger the way you view the market dimensions here and, and to making them more secure and more profitable. So. So I think probably uh, not to impose further on our speakers who we promised we would end at 10.30. Um, so there's, I think, some bad news and, um, and good news here. The bad news is that uh, we haven't answered all the questions. <laughs> and as James said at the outset, this is a pretty challenging and open-ended series of questions. The good news is that this was the first in what will be a continuing series, and so uh, and we are open, by the way, to your suggestions on specific topics of interest, even of, with respect to things that you heard raised today and perhaps inadequately addressed. So I don't know, James, we may have to ask you if you'll co consider coming back. Um, we also have, of course, the CEDAR team, and that's the whole point is 
that this set of issues is precisely what we hope over the next several years, four years actually, that we'll be able to help address through the resources, talents of uh, the collected experts that um, uh, thanks to the CEDAR program we've been able to put together. So I'll close just by noting the uh, title and date for the next webinar, which is Scaling Up Private Climate Financing, which I think is uh, very much the next logical question. Okay, um, you've seen the challenge. You've seen some of the uh, incipient ideas. How do you scale it up? How do you try to address the actual scale that these interesting examples will require. So with that, I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking